Good, uh, good morning, everybody. So my name is Giovanni Lanzani. I work for uh, Goretta Driven. I'll present myself in a bit. Uh, that's my Twitter handle if you want to tweet uh, snarky comments live. My wife usually monitors that, and this morning she was angry with me, so you make her happy with all the negative comments, and uh, I encourage you to do so. I also encourage you to, do, to ask questions during the lecture. Uh, I built uh, probably 10 minutes of question time in the slide. And if you don't ask questions, I've instructed Fabian to ask very boring questions for you. So uh, you're better off asking them yourself, if they're not boring. Uh, so who am, he, uh, am I? So before 2006, I was in Italy. I did a bachelor in theoretical in uh, physics. Then I came to Leiden, where uh, somehow I managed to get a master and a PhD in theoretical physics. Um, doing uh, DNA stuff. And then uh, I went for one year at KPMG where I was PowerPoint monkey. And um, in the practice, I was doing software code reviews for large companies, financial institutions, the government, and so on. And after that, uh, Godata Driven made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And it luckily involved no dead horses. So I, I switched over, and I'm a data whisperer since then with Goddard Driven. And it's two years that I work at uh, ING plus other uh, financial institution clients. Uh, so what the talk is about, I will present uh, four cases about things we do in uh, real-life machine learning and real-life data science. What are the things that we encounter, and what can you expect in the, in the real world. It's not all about financial institution, but it's also about financial institutions. So let's, uh, let's get started. So as I said, that's my Twitter handle. So machine learning in the field. That's, uh, that's a quote by Dan uh, Airely, uh, which is uh, either about teenage sex or uh, machine learning. Actually, the real quote was about big data but it translates very well into, uh, into teenage sex. Um, and I find that uh, very telling, because especially here in the, in the um, uh, in, well, companies, here they all heard about machine learning, so you probably, uh, you probably start hearing the buzz also in, uh, in academia, and everybody wants to do that. But once you go there and you ask, okay, so what should we do for you? They have absolutely no clue what, uh, what they want to do. They have absolutely no clue what the data is, how big the data is, and so on. I make, an example, I make examples along the way. However, the big challenge in machine learning is data quality. Um, I'll touch briefly why that is the case. Well, we just got Monday, I think, a presentation by, by one of the interns uh, at ING. And uh, the take-home message uh, from her, so she, she's still doing her master, I think. And uh, at the end of the talk, the supervisor, uh, if we can uh, call it that, has what have you learned from this project? And uh, the answer was, real data sucks. And it's actually, it's true. So you are, I mean, there are some fields where Having good data, it's really, really, really important, finance being one of them, uh, because you need to have good data if you want to price your uh, products. You need good data for uh, regulatory uh, requirements and so on. But everything around that is usually not very good. And we'll make, we'll make uh, some, uh, I mean, we'll have some funny stories about that. Um, one question that I get usually here is, but didn't the issue always existed? I mean, what has machine learning has to do with data quality? If Who knows how a traditional database works? Here, there, somebody. Well, anyway, just think, who knows how Excel works? Yeah, more. Okay. So just think of like Excel, but where you give a type to your column. So you say this is a number there's something else, and when you put new data in, the database warns you or actually blocks you if the data is not in a good format. Uh, 
In Excel, you also can give the type, but it doesn't, that usually doesn't complain. Uh, if, uh, if data is not in a good format, a database usually will do that. So numbers are, are validated on insert, and it's, even though it's still not enough, and we'll see why. But text, usually it's not. So you put in a name, and for the database, it's just a string, and uh, whatever you put in, it's just a valid string, usually. And a lot of machine learning algorithms use text, and they need good text. And we'll see why is that. So all the bad strings rotting in, the, in databases are now coming to light, and they're biting you uh, where you don't want to be bitten. And the fact that this is a bit of a political comment. Uh, 15, 60 years ago, maybe 20, around the, the IT bubble, also here in the Netherlands, you had a, a kind of an IT bubble, so everybody want, wanted to be in IT. And uh, people that get a degree in, uh, I don't know, uh, philosophy ended up in IT. And uh, it really does not help having a degree in philosophy and uh, working in IT. So it kind of shows after 10, 15 years all the technical depths that IT system have accumulated here in the Netherlands. So that's also something that uh, you, will, uh, you will have to deal with. And at the end of the talk, there's a, you will have a nice take-home message uh, to help you deal with that. So numbers, they mess up numbers all the time. They put 10 euros when they mean 10,000 euros. They put 10,000 euros when they mean 10 euros. Unlikely never happened to me this one, to my bank account. It's always, it's always they never miss a K in there. Um, they put 543,24 when they mean 2 euros. And this happens all the time in reporting, especially. So it doesn't happen when you, well, you know, when you, when you make a trade, luckily. But when you get the reports of the trades, it happens so often that they just have the numbers wrong, flat wrong. So we would see, uh, we would ask the system, what is the revenue of this company? And it would say is uh, 12 euros for the whole year. And then we go and, uh, you know, we know that it's not true, but nobody knows why it's 12 euros. Again, sometimes user ineptitude, sometimes people just don't know. They didn't plan their system to, uh, to have this sort of data quality. We just had a meeting yesterday with Drona where data quality, it's really something which is um, becoming more and more important. Another thing, also very nice, they send you a CSV. Who knows what a CSV is? So it's basically just a comma separated values file, where every field is delimited by comma, so you name, address, and so on. So they send you this file, and they use comma also for the decimals. So some decimals have the comma, because they are not integer. Some they are not, so every, the whole file is basically messed up. If you think this does not happen, it happens to me almost daily, that if we get a dump, somebody use CSV, instead of a more apt format, and there are commas for decimals or commas in the address or the name of the company or whatever. It happens really, really, really all the time. Strings, they put passe and then a space instead of passe, without space. They put passe with an invisible character instead of passe without the invisible character. They put passe with an encoding and passe with another encoding. Why is this important, you may ask? Uh, it's important because we have a thing here in, the, in Europe, uh, which I don't really have in the US, which is called privacy. And uh, uh, for privacy, we need to actually anonymize your data. And one of the things we use to anonymize the data is to take the hash of Strings. Who knows what a hash is? A couple of people here. So a hash is, well, it's very simple. 
Do we have a? Okay. So what's a hash? It's something. It's a function uh, that takes an input and outputs a string, which of variable length, could be 32, 64, or whatever amount of characters, which is looks like gibberish to you. But it's you. It's Every time you will give that input, you will get the string back. So every time you put the name Fabian, you will get the same hash back. The nice thing about hash is that you cannot go the other way because it's irreversible. So if, even if I know what's the hash of the name Fabian, I cannot go back to Fabian. So that's something that we use a lot of the time to preserve uh, the anonymity of Fabian. So we never see his true name or his address or his gender or whatever. Well, gender is not really useful. Uh, but we always see his hash. The point is, it comes a, a, a moment where you want to join two different data sets, and you do that by using the hash because you don't have the real name of Fabian. And the hash of passé with a space is different than the hash of passé without a space. And the same if you have an invisible character or if you have a different encoding. All the hashes of this are different from each other. So if they mess that up, you cannot join the data set. It also depends on the hashing algorithms that you're using. And if you're using other things are as a salt and more technical things. So once we get the data to analyze and it's already hashed, we need the hash to be good. Uh, so this already said. So what happens in financial institutions, and not only in financial institutions, they always mess it up. We send them the procedure, like line by line, this is what you should do. Please do that. Please do that. Please do that. And still, things go wrong. So what do you think the solution is here? Yeah, maybe. Other suggestions? Do it yourself. Do it yourself, which is a very good one, actually. Look for anomalies in the data. Yeah, I look for anomalies. So try to, uh, once you get a new data set, try to join and see if it joins at all. But what if you want to fix uh, the process upstream? So it turns out that in our group, um, we have a guy which is like two meters high, very large. He's like the ex-champion of uh, some uh, wrestling competition here in the Netherlands. And we send him over. And when we send him over, all the hashes turns correct. And if you think I'm joking, this is really not a joke. We really send him over. And somehow the hashes always come back clean once it's been there. It's, uh, it's very wonderful. And this tells you something about how, it's work, how, the, I mean, how it works in the businesses here in the, Netherlands, in the Netherlands, everywhere in the world, that the interest, of the, uh, the interest of the guys you need something from, they're never aligned with your interest, by definition. By definition. So you need something to coerce them, be it Chuck Norris or money or something else. So be... I mean, even if they had the procedure, they knew how to do it, we really explained them carefully, they will still get it wrong because they just don't care. And if you think this is not an issue in your work life once you get out of academia, well, think again because this will for sure happen to you. So be sure to have a plan B for user ineptitude. Now, now let's, uh, let's do some real cases. Uh, the Chamber, Dutch Chamber of Commerce... Uh, called us, the Kamer van Koophandel. And they had a problem which, who knows what uh, the Dutch Chamber of Commerce here? Just heard it by name. Yeah, so by the number of raised hands, you see immediately what's the problem with the Chamber of Commerce is that nobody knows who they are or what they do. 
so they really feel uh, useless. So they called us and said, well, we would actually want to improve our visibility. So we went there, and uh, what we did was to combine data from the uh, Central Bureau of Statistics, the Dutch Central Bureau of Statistics, Google, and the uh, Chamber of Commerce database. And the product we want to create to increase the visibility was a kind of a restaurant recommender. And I'll show you how that looks like. Um, the result was that uh, the chairman of the board of uh, the Chamber of Commerce mentioned the recommender uh, on the Financial uh, Dagblad, the financial, the Dutch Financial Times, the Dutch uh, Business uh, Radio, and I got to present the results to the board. And oh, there's supposed to be a picture here. Oh, here. Oh, sure. I forgot to say, this is the problem that the Chamber of Commerce has. This is a similar plot to what Fabian showed. Is the interest measured through Google for the Chamber of Commerce? And even though when the Telegraph published an article titled the Chamber of Commerce is disappearing, it just caused a bump in the interest that people had, and it then it just continued to slow down. And if we look a bit more in details, all the interest comes from, is that Curaçao, Willemstad, and Oranjestad? and mostly not from the Netherlands. So it's very, this is a very telling picture of why the Chamber of Commerce was alarmed. So what we did, uh, you as a future restaurant owner could use this portal and put on the postal code of the restaurant, uh, of, uh, of where you wanted to open the restaurant. So one of the four, four digit postal code here in the Netherlands. And the portal will tell you something like how many restaurants did open after 2011, how many did close after 2011. The recommendation for your restaurant, so I'm sorry you cannot see here, but it basically says if you're opening a, opening a restaurant here, you would uh, either should be a chic or a high-end restaurant or an ethnic restaurant or a match restaurant. Match means for singles. Uh, we determined that analyzing all the postcode data of restaurants in the Netherlands, seeing how many were closed, how many were still open, the demographic of people living there. So here I'm just showing um, gender and income, but we, all, we were also showing how many families were there, how many singles were there, how many couples without kids were there, and so, and the, yeah, and that. And so we basically train an algorithm to say, well, this is the kind of restaurant you do want to open. We also took data from Google to see what was the average rating of restaurants in the area to help them out. So that's one possible uh, scenario. The other is if you want to open a restaurant in... Uh, uh, you could have a very different outcome, which is in Dutch, niet doen jou. cannot see it here. But basically the algorithm is saying you should not open a restaurant there because of how many closed and so on. Again, this is a typical example of what Fabian said. It would be very hard for us to make a generalized model without using the data we got there. How could we know what's a good restaurant to open there? Or how could we know that your probability to just fail there? It's something that probably can be done with a lot of effort, but it's much better to just train this model on all the data that you have and let him do the speaking for you. Second uh, case, these are financial institutions. Um, and what they asked, question about the first one. No? Okay. Second case is a financial institutions. They have a portal uh, where people can search for um, business activities like uh, restaurants or bars or supermarkets and uh, see when the opening hours are. And uh, 
they ask us, can you measure the impact of an event by using basically the log files of this portal where people can search. So basically all the uh, behavior of the people using the website. And can you then compare it with a day before or a week before or four weeks before uh, to measure if there was an event or not in that particular day? So the portal looks like this. I mean, the portal, the product where we built looks like this. You put a postcode in there. You put a range in kilometers from that postcode. And then you decide uh, the date that you want to analyze. In this case, this is Queen Day three years ago, when it still was on the, 20, on the 30th of April. And we want to compare it a week before. So basically see what people searched on the on Queen's Day and the day preceding Queen's Day um, on this portal. The results look first like this. So you can see basically a map of the postal code where in blue you have the location of activities that were searched less compared to a week before and in red, the location of the activities that were searched more compared to a week before. You can also see a plot of the two days. So you can see that in uh, light blue, we have the behavior of a week before. So Monday and Tuesday look more or less the same. And in dark blue, you can see the day before Queen's Day and Queen's Day itself, where everybody on Monday was busy uh, buying beer, and everybody on Tuesday was busy drinking beer. So this is something that you can really, something that data can tell you. Also, it uh, ties back to the examples that Fabio was doing before. You can break down by sector. So for example, I want to see the bars and restaurant, and I want to see uh, hotels or whatever in there. What are the challenges? The challenge is that, as I already said, the data quality is a mess. In the data, we have the location ID of the activity of the restaurant or bar or supermarket. And through the location, we are able to get the address. And through the address table, we get the latitude, the longitude, so that we can plot it on a map. Except that for 40% of the data, we cannot join the table with location ID with the table with latitude and longitude. And the reason is people put in Monaco Strat in one table and Monaco in the other. Or Italia Cade and Italia Cade without the umlaut. Or instead of light supply, they put airplane and so on. So to solve that, we use the Leverstein distance, who knows what the Leverstein distance is? So it's basically a method and it allows you to compare two strings and to say how many changes you have to make in a string to get to the other. So basically it's kind of a distance between strings. So if there's a letter of difference, it counts as one and so on. We can compute the distance and join, for example, when the distance is above a certain threshold. What the threshold should be like is the $1 million questions that, again, ties back to what Fabian said. This is not a rocket that needs to go on the moon. So you have to embrace the idea that you will commit errors. And then these errors, you may not never know the truth about that. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's look at an example. Luckily, we also have the city in the table, so that helps our accuracy. Uh, let's do the, an example with Monaco STR. And we can see that we have three alternatives in our database. The first that has a distance of three, the second of five, and the third of eight. So we could say, I want to take the lowest distance if the distance is less than three. In this case, I would get a good match 
because I know that Monaco's STR is Monaco Strauss. In the second case, Italia Cade without the umlaut also joins with the Italia Cade with the umlaut, and because you get the lowest distance of one, which is less than five. So here our method also works. In the third case, Alplane doesn't match anything with a distance less than five. And you may say, well, I kind of suspect that this is later plane, but could it not be Lutuli plane, which is a real uh, square in Amsterdam? So your method here actually insulates you from what you would consider an uncertainty which is too large. We cannot know if this will match with this one. In the third case, we had the Burgemeester van Berlijn Kade, but it's uh, shortened with B van Berlijn Kade, and actually it got matched to the wrong record here. So this is one of the cases where you're making an error, but it's a trade-off. We cannot get everything right because something got lost along the way, the Burgemeester, and there is no way to get it back. Questions here? So at the end of the day, we remain with some records we were, that were not joined, with some record that could have been wrongly joined, even though we don't know the percentage there. But it's much better than 40% that we had before. The third case. Uh, there is a large company with a large sales organization, more than 1 billion uh, euros per year, that asked for help with cross-selling. Uh, so what we thought about was to use the recommender approach, the online recommender approach that Fabian was telling you about, try to apply there. The only issue here is that when you are a customer of a one uh, of a company large as this one, you usually don't give ratings to the products that you buy. Think about buying a, a, a swap. Do you all know what a swap is? Yeah. Or about buying some fixed income. You want to buy some uh, uh, Polish corporate bonds. You're not going to give a, a rating of how you like the product. So what we did was to use a I would call it state-of-the-art implicit recommender using matrix factorization. Who knows what matrix factorization is? Where well, Sardana knows? They know there. Well, basically, you're assuming that the preferences of users are given by latent factors. So, impli uh, so how do we would say, uh, factors that you don't know what they actually are. And that you don't care from where they come from, you only care that those factors can give an actual, accurate representation of the user preferences. So that's matrix factorization. And the fact that it's implicit uh, comes, uh, it's about the following. So let's say you bought once the Polish bond. So we all know in finance, buying one bond is not a strong indication of liking the product or needing the product. It could have been an error. It could have been whatever. So the implicit recommender says, OK, this guy likes the product, but we have a low confidence. Let's say a confidence of 1 plus epsilon 1. If you, on the other hand, bought 10,000 Polish bonds, the system would say, well, this guy actually like, likes it, and I can give it a much higher confidence, epsilon times 10,000. If you never bought the bond, the 
Cecilia. And it was won by this metric factorization uh, guy. So that's what I mean by state of the art. But we have a problem that Fabio mentioned. How can we explain to sales the recommendations? So now let's say we get client uh, uh, Drona that likes, that the algorithm says he should like Polish guns, and I need to call him. And I know Drona is a reasonable guy, so I can say, hey, there's an algorithm that t told me that, uh, but there are a lot of unreasonable guys to which I cannot say that. So we have this, we have this, what I would call good results, but we're left with this issue of we don't know how to sell it to the client. So what to tell them once we make the call. Another team, let's call it Team C, on the side while we're doing this, they ask for something else to us. They ask for a cross-sell sector analysis. So basically what it is, it says, I know that our institutions have some clients. Uh, we don't know all of them, but we know that the clients which are relevant to our product all are in this sector. So to make it uh, uh, more specific, I know that um, I know that the supermarket has some students that go to it, and uh, I know the students like I don't know hummus because I see hummus uh, here on the table. But I want to target all the students that uh, come in by p pushing hummus to them. So this is very simple analysis. You basically take all the students. You look at the one that are buying hummus, you take them out, and you send an email or whatever or notifications to all the others which are not buying hummus. How much time would you think that is needed to do this? If you have the data. Somebody wants to guess? You have the data, you know the students, you know hummus, you know everything. Somebody wants to take a guess? One hour, ten hours, ten days, ten months? With or without data cleaning? Data is clean. Clean as a supermarket. <laughs> Nobody wants to guess? So you have the list of students, you know who's buying hummus, and you have to know who's not buying hummus. How much time would you think it takes? Maybe half a second. Half a second is a good one. Somebody else? Half a second, one, two, three. Well, it takes actually something like 10 minutes. The point is that when Team C came, sorry, came to me and asked me, it was like two months ago, and asked me when can this be ready, uh, they told me, can you do it by Q2? Q2 is April to June. And I can actually say, well, it can be in your desk in like 20 minutes. Uh, because I actually needed to go back to my computer to do that. Uh, but out of this half a second or 20 minutes analysis, 50 new leads came out with potentially 20 million euros new business for institutions. You cannot, make the sort of, you cannot make the sort of money selling hummus. That's why we don't do it for supermarket. Uh, but this is 40% revenue growth for Team C if everything goes through with a 20 minutes analysis. What does this tell you as a potential practitioner in the field? Some, somebody else that wants to venture? So if your data science is, or machine learning, is mostly almost useful if you didn't pluck the low-hanging fruit. I mean, just asking this question, if, if, if you cannot answer the question, who should I sell hummus to, you're, and, and, and the data that you have is so simple, Machine learning won't help you there. And simple, just business analytics or business insights and half a second work will actually do much more. 
So once you go to a company or you have a, a problem and you say, I want to do machine learning here or I want to do data science here, please first make sure that the low-hanging fruits are already collected because they will win you so much more than machine learning. And the example is Netflix gave a 1 million euros out just to get 10% better recommendations. So machine learning can help you there, but something as, as this is just much more powerful. Four, as it was brought in. So we were working for a uh, bread producer here in the Netherlands, and they asked us to forecast how much bread will be sold per supermarket and per bread type tomorrow. Uh, the bread is very peculiar because the time to live is usually one day. They should so sell it on the same day that it was baked. However, I saw the data and I know somebody's cheating because sometimes we see that they uh, sold much more bread than what was delivered. So they had to sell bread that was old. But that, that on the side, we were presented with uh, sold bread, uh, bread delivered, and bread throw away. And again, because of data quality, you would think that this equation holds, but it doesn't most of the time, for one reason or the other. Anyway, we enrich the data with discounts. Who's not Dutch here? Yeah, discounts is just that the most important things that drives what Dutch are buying. <laughs> so like we have holidays, we have weather that influences how much bread is sold, but discounts is just like, like three times as much. So they don't care what kind of bread they like, they'll buy whatever is in discount. And <laughs> Sardana is laughing here, but <laughs> I got the data that backs my claim. So what we did, we, say we trained a random forest uh, with 3 4% accuracy. So basically, we could say tomorrow how much bread will be sold with 4% a, a accuracy. We started a pilot. And I got a free t-shirt for the PyData conference that takes place tomorrow uh, for the one that guesses correctly how the supermarket owners reacted to the uh, recommendation that the model did. And I really have the t-shirt. It's here. It's uh, L, and if L doesn't fit, I can probably fetch you an uh, M or uh, S next week, and I'll give it to Drona for the winner. So take your guesses. Yeah, you, 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 yeah, you. So this is the, this is the T-shirt. The sponsors. The conference is taking place tomorrow. We still have 10 places left if you want to register. Anyway. How did the supermarket owners react to an algorithm telling them uh, I should, you should do this? You should order this amount of bread. They told you that they had like 40 years experience and that they know themselves a lot better than your algorithm. Well, this is what they thought, but this is not what they did. And they, they probably said they would use it and then didn't? Uh, yes and no. I, let's see the other uh, answers. So you think they ordered more bread, less bread, whatever they thought, or they ordered much less, much more? No, no. <laughs> I wish that were true. <laughs> Nobody? So you think much more bread, much less bread? I mean, the algorithm says something, and you as a supermarket owner, would you increase that, would you decrease that, or what would you do? Exactly the same. Well, I also wish that were true. So less because you didn't trust it? No, but then uh, we have no just another correct, correct question. So it's not less. They order much, much more. Um, so much more that, so for one of the supermarkets, I still remember, we predicted that he, sh he would sell like 180 pieces of bread on the Sunday. And he actually ordered 160 more pieces because I said, I know better. And he threw out 
153 pieces of bread that Monday. So this is another problem that it's really, uh, well, it's a real problem. You go to somebody and you tell them you should do this, and they will almost never listen to you. And this guy just didn't do it for a single day. He continuously were ordering some, something else to what the algorithm were suggesting, was suggesting, and it was throwing out a lot of bread. So again, even if your model is very good, 3-4% accuracy is pretty good, still people may not listen to you. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, um, it's a drawback or it's an advantage of machine learning and data science, depending on uh, your individual inclination, is that you need to be good with people because you will have them to convince of things that a lot of the times you can't explain to them. And that's a typical soft skills. And as a theoretical physicist, physicist by trade, I, will, I really sucked in soft skills. And uh, actually, my wife, she's a, she has a mass, uh, bachelor in diplomacy. And I always do what she says because of that. Uh, but if you want to get into, into data science and into machine learning and, in general, uh, into this kind of territories, be prepared that your soft skills are just as important as your hard skills, something that you don't, uh, you, well, you don't get a lot in the university. But uh, please be advised that they're super important. Questions? We're hiring. Thank you. <laughs>